Hello and welcome back to the Masterclass Tactical Podcast. My name is Haydar Rubani and I'm your host as ever today. I'm joined today by my usual co-host Rob Blanchett. How are you doing today, Rob? After that nil-nil, pretty drab draw to be honest with you. And obviously we're going to be breaking that down today. How are you feeling today and how are you feeling about the results? Yeah, I feel fine, uh, Haydar. I think uh, goalless draws are allowed. You are allowed to defend. You are allowed to protect. It's all part of the game. Um, and I feel a lot better about the result than I think a lot of Manchester United fans feel ultimately. But uh, a, a draw against a fellow Champions League club is never a bad result. Yeah, I think so. Perspective is very, very important. Before we go forward and break this performance down tactically and also we'll talk about some of the fan reaction to it because I think we do need to add a little bit of perspective. I ask you guys please like and subscribe to the Elite Football Show on YouTube. Make sure you check us out also on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. We're really pushing the audio there. Again, Elite Football Show. We'll put the description link in the description below. But let's move on, Rob, and let me talk about my feelings towards it. So I looked at the team selection and I thought, right, Oli's going to keep it very very tight i think he had a game plan to ensure that we were organized we're disciplined we didn't give too much away we all know chelsea have a huge amount of attacking talent uh which could really really hurt us there's a lot of pace there and i expected him to around the 60th minute probably bring on those game changes and i did say to you actually because we spoke before the game that that def- that bench was monstrously good <laughs> henderson axel pogba cavani van der Beek. Greenwood, I believe I'm missing someone out there, but um, and not even Tellers on the bench. But it's not really how I wanted us to play, and that's from my personal view. And everyone has different views, and Ollie would have had a different view going into it. But I just wanted to see us take a few more risks in that first sixty odd minutes or so. Ultimately, yesterday didn't work, and it would have done on another day, and we would have been sitting here with a one two nil victory. And we've been saying, as as we said off camera, an absolute masterclass. But uh, Talk to me about your sort of initial feelings towards how we did set up, because I know a lot of fans are quite upset about it and some are right, some are wrong. Yeah, I think, you know, we've seen Ole set up as a 4-2-3-1 constantly and consistently throughout his Manchester United tenure as manager. So there was nothing new about that yesterday. It's not like he set up with a a 5-4-1 and completely shut the door. The idea was to make sure that you could look after Chelsea's attack. You know, we all know how good Pulisic is. You know, Werner kind of caught fire last week and Havertz is on a kind of slow trajectory going upwards. So United had to deal with that. Now, we all want our team to take more risks, no doubt about that. But are Manchester United really in a position after the games that we saw straight at the start of the season where they looked vulnerable, certainly at the back? You know, if you're the coach of that team, do you just say, yeah, let's take risks? So I don't believe that Ole did anything wrong yesterday. I think tactically it all made perfect sense. Chelsea had one shot on target, which I think is a success. Defending is a huge part of the game, especially the Premier League, where you have to be able to stop your opponent. And I don't think the shape of the team was at all kind of overtly negative. People might question certain selections within the starting 11. You know, obviously, there's a big debate around Van der Beek and Dan James and other players who actually who are actually starting and who are not. But was it really that bad? For me, no. I thought United you know, probably should have won the game, even though I think a draw was a fair result. United had all the big opportunities. Rashford should have scored. Cavani had two good, really good chances to score. Mendy had a great game in goal for Chelsea. And when you know that your opponent, your opposition goalkeeper have had, has had such a good game and also had a real kind of um, uh, influence on the final result, then you can only say that it wasn't as bad as some Manchester United fans are actually saying it was. That's the thing, isn't it, Rob? It, there's always two extremes to everything. Those that are saying sit in the camp that think you know exactly like you said earlier on in the beginning it's a nil nil it's a draw against the champions league club there's another another camp that think it's absolutely absolutely unacceptable i sit somewhere in the middle like i said to you off camera and i said to you yesterday i wanted to see more attacking intent ultimately look we moved to a back four and let's talk about that selection now when we were banging the drum after the psg game we were both saying Don't expect Axel to start because he's been out since December almost. Well, that was his last start. And looking at the sports science and looking at all these things, all the data they collect in training, 
Oli wouldn't have made a, this decision on a whim. It's all backed up by data. And looking at that team, and we did speak before, going with the same team against Newcastle, was that the correct decision? Let's kind of step away from the fact we got a result, but looking at the way Newcastle play, looking at the way Chelsea play, you could probably understand why some people were puzzled at the fact that we went for the same team against a team that don't really play very similar. Yes and no. And the, and the reason why I kind of say yes and no is because Ole can kind of look at these things and he has all the sports science data at his fingertips. And that's how coaches pick teams in the modern, in the modern day. That's how it works. Ole has to look at fitness levels of everyone and, and what the attributes are that each player brings to his system. Now, personally, I'd prefer United to play maybe a, a kind of more three, five, two centric formation. I think that suits what we have, but you could see what Ole was trying to do yesterday. And that was, he was trying to stop Chelsea being able to get from midfield into the attack with ease, because once they're into the box, they will punish you. So United managed to do that by and large yesterday now, football fans might say, oh, that's too negative. That's very Mourinho. It's so isn't. It's a totally different tactic. But it's also still valid that you do have to stop your opponent. Uh, people are saying as well, you don't want to see United play in this kind of formation at home. Well, there's no such thing as home and away at the moment. Why? Because there's no fans. It, this is all neutral. Every game is neutral. You're on a football pitch with no fans. You could be anywhere in the world. The Chelsea fan, the Chelsea players, are not turning up, going, "Oh, we're at Old Trafford. We're away today, and we feel terrible because there's no fans." So you have to look at it like that. Ole even said this after the game, and I think he said it in his presser as well. Before was that you know you have to look at these differently because there is no fans in the stadium. You don't get that rush and that lift that you would do with seventy-eight thousand fans behind you. And, and we saw this again. I, I referenced the NBA recently. They all played in a bubble. And they all said afterwards, the big issue is that you don't have your fans with you. And it changes the dynamic of the game. And it happens in football as well. Football fans, maybe who sit at home and are not used to being in stadiums and are used to maybe looking at it through a screen, they might not feel the difference because it feels very samey. You know, you've got crowd noise. You've got stuff like that that makes the product look similar. But it is very different on the pitch for the players. And I hear that constantly uh, as, in terms of feedback from footballers. So it, it is a different kind of scenario, a different kind of mindset. So I think Ole takes all of that into account. And I think yesterday it was about trying to stop Chelsea, but also having enough on the front foot. And I think when you've got Bruno Fernandes in your team and Marcus Rashford playing the way they are, that you do have enough on the front foot. And when it got to, what, 15, 20 minutes to go, Ole really switched it up, didn't he? He looked for the goal. He looked for the winner. He went chasing after it. So it wasn't that he shut the door all the way, which is what we would have seen Mourinho or Van Gaal do in previous incarnations. Mourinho in days gone by might have had one shot on target through the whole match or one shot even just attempted, especially in that last season. Whereas that's not what United are doing or am I seeing something different? You know, 14 attempts on goal yesterday for Manchester United. I think that that is a, a decent sum for any match, whether that be Premier League or Europe, a friendly or whatnot. That 14 chances is pretty good. Yeah, you, you touch on those statistics. I'm just going to read them out here. So, obviously, the full time was nil nil. Uh, expected goals United 0.68, Chelsea 0.21. I mean, that it's just says it all, right? And yeah. yeah, and ultimately, ultimately, you look at it and you think it was a fair result based on the statistics. Hmm. United has 14 shots, as you said, four on target, Chelsea six with only the one on target. And we talk about their attacking. Riches, I mean, it's embarrassing. Timo Werner, £50 million. Kai Havertz, £80 million. Ziyech came on as well. They have Christian Pulisic as well. They've got amazing attacking talent. And that was one of my worries going into the game, that looking at our defence, I was thinking, right, we've got a set up with three at the back. Obviously, when we went with four at the back. Why did Oli go with four at the back? Because okay, taking out, obviously, the selection, let's say Axel wasn't playing, but United... For me, and I think you did mention it the other day, that they look much more comfortable. The squad's geared towards a three at the back, in my opinion. I think we look much more comfortable. I don't feel like we have probably out-and-out -out wingers in the squad, and that's an issue. And you can see, actually, yesterday, I'm not, I don't want to talk about Sancho, and I'm not saying Sancho wins us the title, makes that much of a difference, but when you play that 4-2-3-1, the wingers need to be better. And when Dan James is probably your most natural winger, perhaps apart from Marcus Rashford, I'm talking natural, traditional winger. And we've seen with Dan James, he isn't good enough. That for me was a sign that United probably shouldn't have gone to the 4-2-3-1. But 
I'll let you sort of give your point and then I'll give my response to that. I think there's two reasons, you know, just to answer what you were saying there. I think if you intend to bring Maguire back into the team, which is always was the intention and that two and Zabi was going to sit it out because you can't really play him two games in a row at the moment, you will do going forward. You've really got to look at it and think, you know, what, what suits the players that are there? Well, with a three at the back yesterday, we say if they played Maguire, Lindelof and Shaw, say as a back three, what would have been the danger? The danger would have been that it got done with for pace. So that's that answers that. So you play four at the back. You, you you just play slightly more solid, slightly more narrow, and then it's up to the fullbacks to get forward. And I would say yesterday that the issue wasn't Dan James giving you the width or not the quality. And you know you can you can argue about Dan James's quality is too blue in the face for everyone. You know in terms of whether people think he's good or not. But I, but I would look at the fullbacks. So for me, it's more about in the fourth. If, you, if you're playing a four-two-three-one, it's about what Luke Shaw does and what Aaron Wan-Bissaka does on the front foot. Now, I think that's a bigger problem when you look at, say, yesterday's game than Dan James. I would say Dan James was in the team yesterday to counter-attack with pace. That's why he was there. So he starts on the halfway line and he can run. And that's why Ollie's got him in there. And that's why he's playing, maybe, say, over a Van der Beek. Van der Beek's not slow, but you know that Dan James has elite pace going forward. The issue is, of course, the skill factor and whether he's actually good enough with the ball at his feet. I think most people would say no. But I think also, I think he played well against Newcastle. So you can't you can't have it both ways. You know, when you're a manager and you're trying to pick a team, you can kind of look at everyone's attributes and look at, again, all of the statistical analysis that you get in the sports science. If that tells you on that day that Dan James is the guy to play that position and Van der Beek isn't ready to do that for you in that specific role, then you pick Dan James, you know. And if you don't want Dan James, then you get rid of him. You know, you don't have him in your squad. So this is the other side of the coin is that we're, we're talking about United rotating more and we've talked about that a lot in the last year and about Ole's shackles that have been on his wrists because you've not been able to play formations and different teams. And now we've seen in two games that he's played two very different formations with two different lineups. In fact, three games and had a, varying, a variance of success, you know, in the sense that he's won two games and drawn one against Champions League opponent. And United are not losing 6-1 like they were against Tottenham. So they've stopped some kind of rot. But Manchester United fans, never happy, never kind of content with what they see. They, they always want to see this kind of avert, I call it reckless attacking football because there's no team in the world that plays recklessly on the front foot. Everything is controlled, whether that be City or Liverpool. And in fact, when Liverpool used to play recklessly on the front foot, they never used to win. It was only when they five four. It was only when they yeah. It's only week. when they sorted out their defence and sorted out how to play from the back through midfield and into the attack that they started winning trophies. That's something Manchester United have to learn. It's a process, and it will take time. And after a bad start to the season, I think we can all say that that was the case. Whether it be for as I talked about pre-season training not being there and that hurting United, I think Ole is going about it the right way. I think yesterday you needed some pragmatism. You stopped Chelsea. And arguably should have won the game one, two, even three nil if you take your chances. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you talk about Dan James, I just want to give my view on that. I tweeted out yesterday that I really don't like the abuse. You can sit down and have a, you can constructively break down the player's performance. You can say what he does well, what he doesn't do well. But the abusing, I never want to see him in a United shirt again. It's just too much, Rob. And this is a problem. Our fan base do that. We talk about, being united we talk about supporting our players we talk about all this we're a family the fan base doesn't act like that you pick and choose who you like and you mentioned van der Beek there and we, we might as well touch them here before we go on to a few other topics namely the fullbacks but van der Beek, i said last week and we we did disagree and a lot of listeners have brought that up to me um you know, good luck this week when you bring up van der Beek. i'm going to be doing a podcast with a dutch journalist on wednesday so we'll talk about van der Beek and his character more van der Beek probably has every right to feel frustrated at not playing because he's a top player. I wouldn't say he's top, top bracket. He's a very good player. He's played Champions League semi-final. He's won trophies with Ajax. He wants to play. He wants to do well in Man United. He wants to win. Sitting there on the bench, and you're right. You know, I got it a little bit wrong last week, and I'll put my hands up and admit it, that we're about five, six games in. So if you're sitting here 10 games later and this still is the issue, then you can probably question whether he's Oli signing. But looking out there and... We know that he's not obviously a like for like replacement for Van der Beek. Uh, sorry, for, for Dan James, but surely he's frustrated at seeing 
someone like Dan James out there playing over him. Then when the changes get made, Pogba comes on. Obviously, Pogba's a better player, but there must be something in his head thinking, what can I do to, to get in this side? Because there are glaring holes in this side where perhaps Van der Beek could do a better job. Which one? Tell me. Personally, yesterday, and we talk about that Fred McTominay axis has been very key in big games. Mm -hmm. I would have possibly dropped Bruno back to start with and played Van der Beek further forward. That's what I would have done, possibly. What in what format? What how how would you have done that? Four two three one. I dropped Bruno back into a midfield two. What with the with what? So you drop one of Fred or McTominay? McTominay. Yeah. So you so th I'm not trying to debunk anything here. Yeah. So you would have gone with Bruno sat in front of the back four. Well, and Fred, played... Fred, Fred, or Fred, Fred, probably in front of the back four, and then Bruno a bit further forward, and I would have started Van der Beek. That's what I would have done. Right. I know the whole idea of keeping it tight until the 60th minute, yeah. and obviously, I know, I know you're going to say obviously with Chelsea's runners and Chelsea's attack, but I would have gone a little bit more attacking because I think Van der Beek offers the same work rate as Bruno would have done, and I think Bruno can play a little bit deeper, and I think that I would have had a bit more attacking attacking prowess in the side. That's what I would do. Well, well, if you've got Bruno in your team playing in that system, like let's say if you're playing a 4-2-3-1, he's not in there to attack if he's one of the two. So you've got to look at role players. I always say this about football, about what, what you know, do I, th do I think Fred and McTominay are the correct ball players for Manchester United's midfield? Absolutely not. No, 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 no way. Do I think that they were the right two to play yesterday? 100% yes. Yeah, if you're going to play with a four and then a two and a three and a one, People have to fit the system and people have to know the jobs. Now, Bruno can play that role and he's done it. I've seen him play as a defensive midfielder before, um, whether it be for Portugal or for his previous club, but he's not great at it in the same way that Pogba's not great at it. Yeah, you can play these players in these roles, but sometimes you have to bite the bullet and take a little bit of quality out of your team to allow you to play the way that you want to play for that match. So if we're playing 4-2-3-1 and Ole likes to play the system, and we've we've both said here we'd like to see 3-5-2 and we we see the kind of logic in, in switching it up to that system. If you're going to play that 4-2-3-1, you are going to play Fred and McTominay. You are not going to play Bruno in front of your back four. And the reason for that is that Bruno does give the ball away. You look at his stats. Yeah, he does play True. passes from there that, that are sometimes loose. And even though his work rate is fantastic... He is not in there in a kind of destructive way that Fred and McTominay are. Now, I think Fred and McTominay's issue is that they do both mean that you don't have quality when the ball's at your feet in front of the back four. Now, that is an issue, but that's not how Manchester United were playing yesterday. United were trying to get the ball up to the forwards quickly to that three behind Rashford and using their pace. So the issue is if you bring Van der Beek in, who is, you know, he's not, he's not slow. I wouldn't say he's slow, but he certainly doesn't give you that turn of pace that Dan James does. If you have no intention of using Dan James, then just bin him. Get rid of him. Chuck him out of the team. Get him out of the squad. Because this is what it's about. It's about looking at all your pieces on the chessboard and knowing which one to move at the correct time. I agree with what you're saying. You know, like, I think that, like, for, for me, Van der Beek will find a place in this Man United team eventually. I think he's quality. He was Ole signing. This is what we're told from the football club. Ole has, been, has talked about him in absolutely you know, glaring terms, you know, said about, you know, his, his abilities. One of the things that I heard at Ajax was how, uh, kind of the leader that he is, how mature he is for his age, how he understands tactics. Of course, he's going to be really, really upset sat on the sideline because every footballer should be. If you're not in a team, you should be doing everything in your power to get in that team. And I do believe that Donny will be. I think that's, that's the kind of guy he is. And maybe that's the bit of psychology that Ole's playing. He's saying to him, you know, you've got to train and get to where I want you to be. And when you're ready, I'll give you your chance. So people have to realise that football clubs do not operate on binary terms. It really isn't just as easy as football manager of taking the player in and out and thinking that's that. Or I put my best player in there. So that's how it works. A lot of people said that to me yesterday on Twitter. You play your best team. Well, to Ole, that was his best team yesterday. That's the best team he thought to go out there and get the job done. And by and large, if United take their chances... It is job done, exactly the same way as it was in Paris. Yeah, United bided their time. They looked after the ball. They looked after the key players, which was Neymar and Mbappe, and they got the result, and everyone celebrated it. They did that with Chelsea yesterday. They looked after Werner. They looked, look, look, Werner and Havertz got pulled early by Lampard. 
Yeah, and that yeah. tells you everything you need to know about how that game was unfolding. Lampard said after the game, even though he wasn't delirious or with the result, they were really pleased that they kept a clean sheet and they were really pleased that United didn't take their chances. It tells you everything. So I don't think that, you know, if Ole and the team listen to the noise that comes from the fan base, you know, it'd be a different team every week or you'd have Paul Pogba playing centre forward or, you know, you'd have, you you know, Dean Henderson would be in goal one week and De Gea the next and Henderson the next and it would just go backwards and forwards. It would just be like a game of FIFA. But that's not what football is. It's a sport. It's done on science and science is what pushes selection. And that's what we saw yesterday in every position. I think United got it right yesterday. I think that 4 2 3 1 did work by and large, though I would like to see United play three at the back. However, if you play Harry Maguire at the back with Lindelof, you better hope that one of that back three's got blaring pace. You can't play Luke Shaw as the coverage with those two and think that three works at the back. Very, very happy to report that I thought Maguire and Lindelof, especially yesterday, were excellent. Yeah, they really fantastic. did their jobs. They were a great core. Lindelof was carrying the ball out as a ball carrier that he is and doing things that he should be doing more every week. I'd like to see more of that if they play. Um, but I can't really sit here and moan about the defence and say we were too defensive because we, we didn't play five at the back like Chelsea did. You know, we played four. It was a 4-2-3-1. There was plenty in attack. Yeah, Dan James didn't take his opportunity, but I thought he played well against Newcastle. I thought he would, he's deserving of a chance. Ultimately, did he do himself any favours yesterday? Probably not. But that means that that gives Ole a chance to shuffle the pack and say, right, you've had your chance, Dan. Right, this week, Donny, now it's your go. And that's how it works at football clubs. It's not always a democracy. And that's what the other thing football fans think, that it's about chances, but it's about how a manager assesses the opponent and what he's got to counter that and win a game. Yeah, absolutely. Look, my my thing, I completely agree with it. And actually, it did work because when you look at how well the defence played, we completely nullified Chelsea's attack. Like you said, they hooked Werner. I don't think that's been speak, spoken about enough. Werner and, and Havertz came off. When was it? Was it the 70th minute or something? Yeah, they came like that? off early. Yeah, Very early. And in, they came off early. And the only player that had any, any, any kind of uh, traction was Pulisic. So yeah. Pulisic was, again, getting the kind of space that Neymar was getting against McTominay. So McTominay was physically playing him. But, you know, Pulisic wasn't really getting into the box and creating too many chances. He had one or two decent opportunities and, and cut across the defence a couple of times. But ultimately, Chelsea were frustrated. And this is a team that's just spent literally hundreds of millions on new players, attacking players, to go yeah. and hurt teams. And they came to Old Trafford yesterday and they were the team that set up defensively. They set up with five at the back. You know, they set up to play pure counter and it didn't work for them. And they had to change it to obviously, you know, protect what they had. But United, you know, they still played with that three behind a striker. And we see that most weeks, don't we? It's not it's not yeah, unusual to see United kind of play that system against most teams, whether it's a big club or a small club. Yeah, absolutely. And I've got a, a statistic here that will actually sort of outline how good United were in defence. And only 12% of Chelsea's passes were in the final third, which is why their territory was just 41%, despite yeah. having 58 Well, at that time, 58%. In the end, United had about 50.5% possession, Chelsea 495 But But this, this statistic was sort of, you know, midway through the second half. And that is a really, really good display. And you do mention Lindelof. One particular moment is when, do you remember when Werner got the ball out wide. It was sort of one-on-one -on -one, and the way he pushed him out wide. Yeah, I think yeah. that's something Lindelof does do quite well. We know his issues, but he he delayed Werner. He cut out the space so, so well. And that was fantastic. And that is the thing that Maguire and Lindelof, you looked at that centre-back pairing and I think a lot of the fan base thought, oh God, here we go again. But I was actually very, very impressed. And I, I saw some people on Twitter saying, oh, well, Maguire wasn't that good because it should have been a penalty. They were fantastic yesterday. And it seems that Oli did the right thing, taking Maguire out of the team for PSG. He looked much more like his old self. I'm not going to go wax lyrical. You know, we, we've got to take, we shouldn't judge each game by by it comes really. But you're right that the two in front of them did help the two at the back. Didn't they? Yeah. And, and I don't think it's any surprise that we've seen a kind of upturn in both De Gea and Lindelof's performances since two and Zabi and Henderson are in the scene. Yeah. Competition creates form. Yeah, so you train together, you see what the other guy can do, and you think, 
I better do I better do a little bit better. I might have pushed myself a bit more. I think that's what we saw with Lindelof. I think last season there was no competition really for him. So he was comfortable and he made the same kind of mistake over and over again. And we saw it at the start of this season. He made the same kind of mistakes. Axel is now back in the picture. Axel will be available for selection for multiple games going forward. He wasn't ready yesterday. That was the right decision to pull him out of the team. I've been saying it for days after the PSG result. And we're seeing that Lindelof and Maguire both played better than they have done for the whole of the start of the season because there's a little bit of genuine competition. And that's good. That's a good thing. Fans shouldn't be upset about that, the kind of that these players feel that their positions are at threat. And this is why I'm happy that you've got a Van der Beek on the bench. Because Van der Beek's ready. You know, as soon as the Ole feels that he can drop this guy in and that the system fits it and the opponent fits it, Van der Beek's going to be playing. Yeah. Let's not have any two ways that two kind of way confusing about this because I still believe 100% that Van der Beek is Ole Gunnar Solskjaer signing. You know, he would not have come to this club if we didn't have this manager. Another manager might have refused him. Uh, so I just think it's time and people need to kind of calm down with the selections. Lots of people were really upset before the PSG result with the selection, weren't they? You know, people were going, oh, Tuin Zabie's not played for a year. And then afterwards, people were going, oh, what a great, great selection that was putting Tuin Zabie in. You can't have it both ways. You know, yesterday... United nullified Chelsea with that selection. People didn't like the selection before the game. Afterwards, people were upset because they didn't win. <sighs> but Rob, there's always a big uproar about selection. It doesn't matter. Always. Yeah. Uproar. Look, I knew, so I tweeted that before the game and I was surprised, but I did say, like I said at the beginning, that I, there was a game plan to it and you could see what Oli was going to do. And like we said earlier, 14 chances to six. If one or two of them had gone in, we'd be sitting here and we'd be going, what a fantastic performance against a side that spent X amount on new players and we've kept them out and we've scored goals. We've got a clean sheet. It wasn't long ago we'd been smashed by by uh, by Tottenham. But I think also yeah. the other side of the coin is that, again, I interact with some really brilliant, brilliant people that watch and listen to this podcast and i always try and make sure i interact with as many as possible one guy in particular he's i'm not going to mention him but he's a really great guy uh, he's always getting involved but uh, something i didn't agree with what he said is that oh well sir alex sometimes set out to not lose which he did i think people there's a lot of revisionism isn't there that sir alex went and played free-flowing football every single week we played we smashed we didn't do that the amount of times we went away to european games you know in in the first leg and pretty much just tried just sat back and try to either nick a 1-0 win or keep it a nil nil, get that away goal or not. But just because we weren't as effective yesterday, what something that does sort of ground my gears a little bit is that people say, oh, Sir Alex did this, and then they completely compare it to Oli. It's completely different. It's apple and oranges. And people need to stop doing this, don't they? Because this is Man United 2020. We're not in the same football sphere as it was back then. And Oli needs to be judged on Oli. We shouldn't be bringing up Sir Alex because there's going to be only one, there's only one Sir Alex, and it's just not. It's it's not right, is it? Ole, Ole should absolutely be judged on his results, his tactics, and how he sets the team out and how happy the Manchester United players are under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. What I will say in kind of, not to refute what you're saying there, but Sir Alex Ferguson, I, I said this yesterday, did come outside the top 10 for three of his first four seasons. Now, if that had happened today, the whole world would have burned down certainly via Twitter. You know, if he'd come 11th, 11th and 13th, like he did, that's fact in those ter in those times, uh, in those first four seasons, he would have been gone after six months with, with the current Man United fan base. So uh, it, expectations are one thing. And I think that's more what we're talking about is how fans kind of gauge themselves and their own emotions. Um, you know, Ole's just finished second last season. We've talked about it again. It's old hat that he got more points than City did and Liverpool did in that running from January to the end of the season. People have forgotten this. It's It did happen, but it's it's no longer valid to them. And we are five games into a new season with a game on hand on the rest of the league. If United win their game in hand and win the next match, they're potentially a top of the league. So all of this stuff, we talk about re revisionism. The revisionism comes actually game to game rather than talking about Sir Alex. So we can talk about Sir Alex and we will do because he is a yardstick and obviously all the success that he had and that was obviously fantastic. But you've also got to look at how he built the team progressively over a three or four season uh, period. And I, were, I was there. I remember it. We were awful. 
We were awful in those years. Much worse than we are today under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Much worse football. It wasn't all attacking football. It wasn't this kind of maverick style that people pretend that Manchester United always were. Yeah, Fergie definitely managed to find attacking football in a way as the answer to all of his problems. And they did attack most of the time. However, funnily enough, when we played Jose Mourinho's uh, Chelsea, Fergie would quite often set up defensively against them to stop Robin, to stop Drogba. Park Ji Sung was one player you know, uh, Fergie always reverted to in the big games to, to essentially to nullify the, the opposition. And it's not unusual for any top manager to do that if he feels that's what he has to do. And people say, oh, Fergie didn't do it often. No, he didn't do it often. But I don't think Ole changes his tactics that much for me to for, for some of me to sit as a journalist and say, no, he does it often. He does it when he feels he has to. And he played 4-2-3-1 yesterday, which is a formation he's played consistently all the time. So fans, you know, fans can't have it both ways. They just can't, you know, because it's not a fact. It is revisionism. And I, I think it's valid to talk about Fergie because he did he, he did have this extra time at the start of his career at United. And yeah, then for 20 years, he had great success. But, you know, people saying, oh, Ole should be judged now. He's only really into his second season. You know, this last year was his first full season, first full transfer windows. And this is his kind of first summer window with a new season. United just beat in PSG in probably one of their best European performances in history against Neymar and Mbappe. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think so. It's fair. It so you know, comfortable. They yep. look comfortable, yeah. They were pretty comfortable yesterday. And if they took the chances, it could have been a comfortable victory. I think fans just have to bite their lip and just watch for a bit more. But what they do is they kind of get upset about all of these things. And we can talk more about the depth of the tactics now because that's what this podcast is about. But the, at the end of the day, Ole is paid to make these decisions. And you have to back him while he's the manager. And you can say that if he gets it wrong, yep, goodbye Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. Hello, Pochettino. The change happens. But I guarantee you fans will be doing exactly the same thing with Pochettino that they are doing today with Ole. And that's what's frustrating because I see that that mirror. Like, I, you know, people say, oh, you're, you're a hypocrite because you did it with, with Mourinho. I wrote multiple pieces back in Mourinho. Yeah, and people forget this. You know, I called for him to be, to, to be in charge of the football club. And I had lots of my peers say to me and other journalists, you're wrong, Rob, because... You know, he will play a style of football that you won't like. And they were right in the end. But I waited until year three to kind of give my own assessment on that and to back that that theory. I've not seen that with Ole. I've not seen something that makes me think, hang on, this guy doesn't understand Manchester United and he doesn't understand what we want him to do as football fans. I think it's all still there. It's so early in the season. Why are we complaining at a goalless draw? It's, it is nonsensical to me. It's funny. Last thing I'll say on that, it's funny that you mention um, Mourinho because before I knew you, obviously I've just met you what like uh, a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. and my view of you, Rob, was the fact that this guy's massive anti Mourinho. And it's funny how perceptions are like that because you know my perception of you before we ever did the podcast together is completely different to what I think now. And I'm like, this is one of the most level headed guys. But from just reading some of your articles or your tweets at the time, I thought this guy's got an agenda, and it's really funny. And it's funny how you know. How many characters you got on Twitter? Hardly anything to write something. And what you actually tweet can actually mold what people think of you. It's, it's crazy. But let's move back on, as you say, to the tactics. I want to talk about the fullbacks. I know you touched on them. When you play a four at the back, and I had a conversation with someone on Twitter yesterday about it. He was saying to me, it was a good discussion. He was saying to me, oh, when you play three at the back, it's more defensive. You're sacrificing a forward. And we've had this discussion last week that it's just, it's nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> it's just absolutely really nonsense. Right. I'm going to let you debunk that. But moving to, for me, moving to a back four means that, especially when you play Fred and McTominay as the double pivot, you need more from them going forward. And we didn't see that. And the thing that stands out, and we've seen that video going around this morning, is the one where, and it made me so, so angry. At the time, it made me angry. And I watch it again, it makes me angry. Is when Bruno tells Shaw, he has the ball to, you know, overlap, make the overlapping run outside me because there's a two on one. And Shaw just stands there, back there. And Bruno just passes it back. And I think that's one of the reasons why Chelsea found it so easy to defend because of the fact that the fullbacks weren't providing enough going forward. We can only play the system, I think, for at the back if there's much more from the fullbacks. Yes. And I think, you know, when you look at the two systems where you're playing a 4-2-3-1 or a 3-5-2, 
both of those systems are reliant on the fullbacks providing the width. Yeah, we we do play wingerless systems now across Europe in the Premier League certainly. And if you're going to play four two three one, then you need Luke Shaw and Aaron Wambasaka to provide width. And I felt yesterday that you know Aaron was trying to do that on the right hand side, but his quality wasn't good enough. We could say that that's a repetitive issue. But I think also what's a repetitive issue is that Luke Shaw, who initially was a flying fullback, you know, when we when he came to the football club, we know he's not as um, as progressive as maybe he once was. Yesterday, that was a problem for me. You know, I watched that game and that was definitely one of the weaknesses where you needed Shaw to overlap on that left-hand side. And that made Dan James's job, certainly in that first hour, uh, a lot more difficult because he was isolated. He didn't have anyone overlapping. It meant that he was kind of being marked one-to-one -one, and that was an issue. And really, Shaw needed to be the guy overlapping or at least supporting him rather than just being 20 yards behind him. Because really, then what can you do if you're Dan James when the ball comes to you? You can either just run the space or turn and come back. And that means that you are, you know, technically in a, in a bad place. You know, what do I do? And I think that hurt Dan James. So I think the left-hand side was definitely... Um, misbalanced, I think is the right word. Um, I think especially in that last 15 minutes where United were, obviously Ole had spun the wheel and was looking to win the game. You saw that with the substitutions. That's when you needed your fullbacks really to push on. And you needed to say maybe sit Lindelof, sit Maguire and maybe leave Fred in there, which is kind of the shape that they did. But then you need your fullbacks to push on. Now, that's a choice. You know, these fullbacks have got to choose to either risk a little bit more and be the guy that gets a cross in or sit. And I think we saw with Luke Shaw, he didn't feel happy being the player that went forward. People said yesterday, oh, you know, why was Tellers not on the bench? I think if you're looking at the system, there is a reason why you wouldn't have an additional fullback on the bench and you might, say, have extra midfielders because that's the system you're playing. And then have an attacker like Cavani. And obviously Greenwood. So it was a very attacking bench, very forward thinking bench. But that means that you can't maybe have that extra defender on there if you're, say, got two and Zabi in there with the worry that maybe Maguire, who's had an injury, might have to come off. So that's the balancing act that Ole has to kind of pull off. And I think in weeks to come, you will see Tellers obviously much more involved. However, do I think Tellers fits a back four better than Luke Shaw? Probably not. Not defensively. I think Shaw is a better defender than Tellez. And I think if you're throwing Tellez into that scenario, you might get punished in the back four. I think Tellez suits the five going forward, playing a three, uh, playing a three, five, two and playing coverage rather than being the guy who's effectively responsible for covering around the back of two slow centre backs. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was what I thought initially when I saw us go to back four. I wasn't surprised Tellers wasn't playing. And I think that's something that I'm intrigued to see because you're completely right. When you look at Tellers, when you played at Porto, just look at his sort of positioning yeah. map, you know, where, where he plays his average. He's pretty much playing as a winger. And the Portuguese league obviously is less competitive than the Premier League. Yesterday, he would have had to probably track back for Rhys James, who's a fantastic player going forward. If you actually look in, uh, at the fantasy football stats, you'll actually see that he's one of the most creative fullbacks currently in the Premier League. And obviously there was Havertz as well, who was playing on that right. But for me, I had a conversation with a Southampton fan probably about a month ago on the podcast, and we were talking about Luke Shaw in particular. And the biggest thing he said about Luke Shaw was that, we all know this, the move to Man United, I think, was too early. That's Let's not talk about that. But let's actually talk about, he said his, his footballing intelligence was a serious problem. And it, it was well known that while he had a lot of talent, he probably should have stayed at Southampton a few more years to develop, but that footballing acumen just wasn't really there. And they did have problems saying to him, look, these are your instructions. You need to go and do this. And he, he struggled to pick things up quickly. Now, with Luke Shaw, I'm one of those that thinks he's not good enough if you want to go and win a title as a fullback. He's not as bad as everyone says as well. It's always somewhere in the middle. But was it a question of Oli saying to him, look, don't go too far forward because that was the tactical instruction? Or is it actually the fact that he just can't simply get up and down that flank the way that we want him to? Uh, I think that part of it was a tactical instruction. Absolutely, because he is there to look after those two centre-backs at times. So that's an issue you see. You, what did you see yesterday? Lindelof carrying the ball out. If Lindelof carries the ball out, someone's got a stick. 
You can't have him carry the ball out, get caught, and then you're done on the counter, aren't you? So I, I see Luke Shaw having much more of a defensive function than I would like him to have. What I will say is this. I've spoken to plenty of people uh, in the trade, obviously, who were at Southampton at the time that knew who Luke Shaw was, what he was doing as an 18-year-old, how good he was, what his strengths and weaknesses are. When United signed Luke Shaw, he was the best teenager in Europe in his position. So we, yeah, we can say about what, you know, what, it, 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 with hindsight, I mean, hindsight's beautiful, isn't it? We all know that Luke Shaw, one of the big issues for him was breaking his leg. Yeah, not the stuffing out of him for two years and it took him a really long way to come back. And I think Luke Shaw is a confidence player. When Luke Shaw is playing well, it's because he's confident. When he's not confident, you see the mistakes. Technically and tactically, I don't think there's too much of an issue with him. Again, when you talk to people at Southampton, the talent that the boy had was that he was a really natural, left-sided, all-round footballer. He could go on the outside, he could come on the inside. You know, he had, you know, even though he's a left-footed player, he can play with both feet. You know, he he has that brain. I think what we see at Manchester United is that it's I don't think it's a it's a technical thing. I think it's more to do with his confidence. So when he's worried about two uh center backs who are slow inside him, what are you gonna do? You're gonna probably play on the back foot. Probably. That's probably what I would do. So I think fans need to kind of appreciate that a little bit more. We can talk about whether he was the right signing or not, or whether he's a, a championship caliber fullback or any of those things. I think they're all valid to question. Uh, I think that's why Manchester United have just bought an attacking progressive left back in Tellez. So there's a, there is an issue there, isn't there? Because that's why you buy someone in that position. You look at it and you say there's a problem, so we need to have balance. Uh, you know, Teller's played against PSG and it worked. There will be plenty of more games, I think, where Luke Shaw will play over on the inside or be sat on the bench because Teller's has found his feet and is the player that is the is the starting fullback. But I think at the same time, people have to be patient. They have to let the process unfold and let's see what happens. Uh, I think for Luke Shaw, he's one of those players that if he plays 15 or 20 games in a row, you know, you do tend to see that his consistency really does improve wholesale and you get a lot more from him. I want to see more assists from him this season. I want to see him becoming the Luke Shaw that he once was, where he isn't scared to overlap. I mean, he can overlap, like you were just saying there. You know, the question is, can he get up and down? Yes, he can. He can get up and down. All of the physical data tells you that Luke Shaw has got the engine to get up and down. There's nothing that people say, oh, he's overweight and all of this. Again, that's that's a fallacy. It's not true when you look at the sport. Yeah, the other way thing is is really is really wrong. It's just uh, you know, the thing the things that people say online is just well, nonsense. it's trash. It's trash talk. So you know, you might like people used to say about Wayne Rooney, isn't it? That he looks overweight or something like that. It's just how some of these players are set. You know, they're just thick set, and that's the way it is. Then they take the shirt off and they're ripped, and you're like, oh, actually, you're not actually that big. Yeah, there's been times when Luke Shaw's been heavier than he should be, but generally we've seen it, haven't we? That after two or three weeks of football, that that he's back to kind of peak fitness. He doesn't look unfit at the moment, not to me. But he was conservative yesterday. I think that was part of the game plan. So there is that. But I think that he needs to take responsibility within the game. Like I think Wambasaka does try to do that on the other side. He tries to get forward, but he runs out of ideas. I'm worried that Wambasaka hasn't got the technical acumen to do that. I'm not massively worried that Luke Shaw hasn't got the technical acumen. I think he ca he has got it but he chooses to sit a little bit more because ultimately he's thinking clean sheet. He's not thinking, can I go and get an assist? And I'd like him to kind of maybe get that balance a little bit more. wan has got lightning pace and a great tackle. So he knows that if he's on the back foot, he can recover. Maybe Luke Shaw doesn't have that faith in his own abilities to do that. And we've seen him sweep up behind those two slow centre-backs too many times already this season for it not to be an issue. Maybe when Tuan Zabi is a starter, and let's hope I hope that that is sooner rather than later going forward through the months ahead of the season, then you might see Luke Shaw thinking, no, I'm going to be a bit braver. I'm going to play on the front foot a bit more because there's someone with pace behind me. For me, Luke Shaw, there was no doubting his ability. We knew we were signing one of the top, like you said, one of the top youngsters around. And if it wasn't for that leg break, it's all, it's all ifs and buts, isn't it, really? But he was on his way. I remember he was the best player that season by a country mile. He looked absolutely fantastic going forward. And you just need to read up about the impact, both mentally and also physically, at that leg break. I mean, that's back in the day, that's a, uh, that's a career finisher. So he's done very well to bring himself back. He's probably playing his best football for me 
since that injury. And people have to remember you had LBG and you had Mourinho as managers and that makes a difference. But I do have concerns with the when we play four at the back because mm. the full back. I, I, I do four, think four, it's been four. coached out. I do think it's been coached out of him. And I, and I believe that is a thing in football. You know, so I think that, you know, we saw what Mourinho's reaction was to, to Shaw and he constantly was telling Shaw not to go. So every time Shaw went forward, Mourinho was on the halfway line going, get back, get back in position. And I watched that from opposite the dugout in my seat at Old Trafford every week. You saw it happen in real time physically. And Mourinho was killing Luke Shaw for that in press conferences, telling him that he was running the game for him and he was acting as his brain, de demeaning and diminishing his player, which I really didn't like, you know, as a manager. And uh, I didn't think that that's, that's good for a confidence player. You have to try and give this player confidence. But in that system, he did have to sit in the same way as I said, I think, to you. Ashley Cole had to do that at Chelsea for Mourinho. So it depends what manager you have and how you're coached. And those two managers, certainly with Van Gaal and, and with Mourinho, they coached that out of him and made him sit a lot more. And you see that now, you know, he is a more conservative fullback when United probably need a progressive fullback. So they've had to go out and buy one. And Tellers is that progressive fullback. And hopefully, you know, if, if Shaw can't do it, then I think you you stand up to that and you say, right, you know, I haven't been able to do it. This guy now gets an opportunity. And then we see if Tellers can be the guy that does it. Yeah, exactly. I think that says all that. The fact that we brought Tellers in, that says to me that Oli probably doesn't see enough attacking output from Shaw. And that's my problem with him in the long run. But let's move on, Rob. And... We saw two changes in the second half, two that we wanted. We saw Cavani come on and Paul Pogba. And when they came on, initially, we saw Bruno push out wide right. Now, I thought when he got pushed out wide right, I thought his, I thought our attack got nullified and I thought his contribution got nullified. And then, obviously, we made another change and he came back and we played sort of 4 2 3 1. Him and Fred were playing in the two holding positions. And then we saw Pogba playing more as a number 10. But just talk to me about how much of a difference those two changes made to United's setup and their threat going forward. Yeah, I think I tweeted at half time that I would have taken Dan James off and I would have brought on um, Cavani and with, with Rashford moving left. But obviously what, what the manager tried to do was to put Paul Pogba as the 10 and that meant sacrificing Bruno. Bruno playing a more kind of pragmatic position on the right-hand side. Uh, it didn't work for me at all. I don't think Paul Pogba is the number 10. I think I've spoken about that to you consistently. But at that moment, I think Ole's thinking was, what do you need from a number 10 at that specific moment of time? Now, you could have played Van der Beek. You could have brought him on instead. But one of Van der Beek's weaknesses as a 10 is that he's not really a, a passer of the ball from that area. He's, an, he's a threat in the box, and he can get in and kind of get into the box and get shots off. But if you want someone to pick the lock, and that's what United were trying to do in the last 15 minutes, then Paul Pogba is probably the right player to play in an advanced role. And that's what Ole did. So there's nothing controversial about that substitution and those changes. That's a very kind of normal way of looking at trying to, wait, trying to win the football match. And that's what United were trying to do in the final 15 minutes. It didn't work. So you have to stand up and say, that wasn't the right tactic. You live and die by your own decisions. But playing Pogba in that role for 15 minutes is not a huge kind of uh, philosophical jump. And playing Bruno in a more reserved role, which is kind of what he was doing, he kind of went into the matter role, you could say, of playing while he was still playing in an attacking position. But it, it did go a bit lopsided. Saying that, Cavani obviously came on and had two excellent opportunities. You know, uh, Thiago Silva saved Chelsea from a, a shot towards the end, which looked like it was on target. Cavani also was excellent on the near post from a corner, flicked the ball and just missed the target. It nearly worked. So I, I'm not sat here thinking, oh, it was a terrible substitution. I've seen some bad substitutions over the years from Ole and from all sorts of managers. But I don't think the changes yesterday were kind of tactically inept. They just didn't work in that period of that final 15 minutes. I thought Oli's substitutions were spot on. I think he did every substitution he made was completely correct. It was the obvious choice to bring on Pogba and Cavani. I think it was obvious to probably shit. Well, I would have actually wouldn't have minded to see possibly the other way around with Pogba deeper and then and then Bruno further forward when we did 
you know, drop Bruno further back. But it doesn't really matter for me because I think both players, I agree with you, Pog was not number 10, but they both can affect the game when they're in that more advanced position. But moving on to Cavani, I thought his movement was actually quite sensational for those two chances he created. I mean, both those shots came from him running in front of the defender. I mean, his first touch was running across and getting his foot on it um, from that free kick, I believe. But yeah. that move, that movement is something that I think we miss, especially, you know, sort of looking at Martial as a player. And my thing with Anthony Martial, I'm not going to go sit here and, you know, put him down because he's a fantastic talent. I always had doubts whether he could play as a number nine for Man United because I don't think his movement is what is required for a top number nine. Martial, for me, likes to come too deep. He likes to collect the ball and then turn. What he did well after the restart was that I thought his movement, he especially made a lot of runs into the channels, pulling the pulling the centre-backs out wide, creating space for Bruno through the middle. But with the Cavani, he played more like a traditional number nine, didn't he? And we can't get too excited. It's only a small sample size, but... For me, that actually gives United a different dimension now that there's going to be someone that will play more on the last man. He's got excellent movement in the box. We just need to get balls into him of quality. Was there anything that, you know, that was positive for you from Cavani or did you just think it was just pretty routine? I mean, look, I'm not going to go wax lyrical again because he wasn't incredible, but I thought there were some good signs there for United that he offers something different that we don't have. I think we got a sniff of exactly what uh, Edison Cavani is yesterday you know and it's quite interesting because you know you again you have to think about the jigsaw pieces and why Cavani has come to the football club what Ole has asked him to do in this kind of brief one or two year period that he's going to be at Manchester United now I disagree with you about Anthony Martial I was a heavy critic of his over the years uh, both when he played on the left and through the centre and that was I didn't I, I didn't think his movement was good enough like like you've just said there I think I saw enough over a six-month period last season towards the end of the campaign to suggest that he can score goals as a number nine, he can assist as a number nine, and he can press as a number nine. Now, they are the three things that I judge number nines on. Quite often with number nines, it depends whether they want to drop out, like a Harry Kane drops out, or whether you want to drop in, like a Sergio Aguero drops in. I think Martial does both. So I'm happy with that. I think he can drop out and play with his back to goal. I think you saw it against PSG where he played with his back to goal in the, just inside the box, spun his man and got a penalty. I like that. Penalty, I, think that yeah. I think that's what number nine should do. Yeah, I like that. However, what, what I would call Cavani is Cavani is more straight line number nine. And what I mean by that is he will play in the space between the central defender and the fullback. Yeah, so he'll go in a straight line. He's got enough pace to be able to do that. And he will try and affect the play both behind the the back four or the back three or and also in front so if the Cavani, if the ball falls to Cavani on the edge of the box he's got a good enough shot to finish but he's also the kind of player that will get across his man and get tap-ins I like that and now that's something that Martial needs to learn Martial needs to be a kind of killer in the six yard box but if you're scoring 23 goals in the season like he did last year then I, I haven't really got a problem I'm not going to moan at players who score 23 goals because that's telling you that you're doing your job we can all kind of uh, wax lyrical about what we expect certain players to do. We can say that Marcus Rashford, when he plays through the middle, is he a number nine? Well, no, he's more of a kind of, I don't know. He's not, he's not really a number 10. He's not a number 11. He's he not plays you know, better in a partnership. I think both Martial and Rashford, I wouldn't say they're traditional number nines. I would say like Cavani. I think they work well together. That's where I think Martial, because Martial for me plays more like a, a second striker. He'd be fantastic with a Cavani, I think. Yeah, you know, like, it, it's, it's, it, it is difficult because it all it all comes down to systems. So, you know, if you're going to play 4-2-3-1, then I would still today pick Martial as my one, as the number nine, and I would have Cavani on the bench. That's how I would start. There is a chance that if you play a kind of 4-3-3, that you could play Martial through the middle and have Cavani on the left, as he did at PSG. So the question for Ole is to obviously see this in training and see who fits his ideas best. Now, I think Cavani is a short-term option, means that you, he's not your kind of all-encompassing um, choice. You know, he's not coming to the football club to be a first choice. He's coming to add competition and to score goals. And I think yesterday he might have scored the one or two goals that that took United over the line. And I think he's a, a much more kind of uh, complete option as a striker than a Galo. So Agalo's decent, but that's all he is. 
whereas Cavani can finish like a world-class striker. And I also think that that players like Rashford and uh, obviously Mason and obviously Martial will learn from playing with someone like Cavani. So there's a lot of upside, um, but it is, it is formation dependent and we will see Cavani start games. But again, this is only his first game at United. I think we saw a sniff of kind of what he could be for us over the next few months. There's no doubt that if you're Frank Lampard and you see Cavani coming off the bench, you're thinking a lot harder than if you bring Agallo off the bench. You know, you're suddenly thinking, do I change to stop this guy? And Chelsea did. You know, Chelsea changed the whole game plan in that second half because it wasn't working for Havertz. It wasn't working for, for Werner. And Chelsea kind of went something a little bit more solid, made sure, you know, that's when it kind of dropped more with five at the back. And that's why I think Ole reacted and brought Pogba on to pick the lock. Because when you had five, it means that if you play Van der Beek as the 10, Van der Beek's got no room to run. There's no space. So that's the issue there. So I think that's why the game kind of tactically kind of unfolded as it did. Yeah, I completely agree with that. What what I will say is that fans were shouting for more quality off the bench. We were shouting for someone better than Igalo. And we I mean, who who really better than someone like Cavani who scored? I saw the statistic yesterday that after Messi and Ronaldo, I don't know if you saw it when it came up the graphic mm. on Sky, Cavani's got the most goals in the past. Is it five years? Something like that. Three to five years. I can't remember. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that just says it all. One thing about Cavani is he will miss chances. That's what a lot of people have said to me when I've spoken to them on the podcast, etc. But he is he is a top striker. So I think that's only a positive. You know, United have options now, don't they, Rob? And, that, and that's the thing that we look at that first. Essentially, look, this is how I see it. You might disagree. The starting 11 for me was almost like a second team, really for me mm -hmm. in terms in terms of we're talking about quality obviously the setup it worked better for the what Ollie wanted to do he wanted to keep it tight he wanted to keep it more compact he wanted to you know nullify Chelsea's attack but Chelsea had almost their first team out there and we we made them look well we were comfortable so that's positive isn't it that's a positive going forward that actually we had the options to change it it didn't quite work but Going forward, Oli's got so many more options now to change from four at the back, three at the back, however he wants to, you know, whether he wants to unlock defences, whether he wants to have more movement in the box of Van der Beek, there's options there. That's a positive, isn't it? United fans need to appreciate this, don't they? Uh, yeah, and I, and I don't think Ole put that team out thinking, oh, this is my second best team. I don't think he thought that at all. I think Ole looked at what Chelsea had and what he had, and he wanted to find a way to be solid and to be able to build off a solid base, and he did that. You know, and this is the whole, I think, wider aspect of talking about players like Fred and McTominay. You know, I, I think after PSG, you know, both those players are, would warrant their kind of choice of being in that first 11. But I am worried about their technical capabilities. I think that going forward, that's something United need to address. You know, we were looking at who is going to play in those roles if you're going to play 4-2-3-1 going forward. I think Ole will play different formations. So it is a kind of a promising sign that he have, now has bench options. But I don't think he was kind of saving his best players for the bench. Like, again, I think we need to break this down and look at it. Paul Pogba had an injury. Yeah, this is why Paul Pogba hasn't played. That's why he wasn't starting against Chelsea. If Paul Pogba's fit 100%, he starts against Chelsea. Mason Greenwood has had an injury all week, hasn't trained. Yeah, that's why he didn't start against PSG. That's why he, didn't, well, he wasn't part of the squad. And that's why he didn't start yesterday. If he's fit, he probably starts over Dan James. You know, so... Fans, again, have to kind of understand how football clubs work because I, I think a lot of reaction is just born from emotion about seeing an 11 players on a team sheet than it is about the tactics of the game. And I don't think Ole went out there and went, oh, do you know what? I'll put my second best team out first and then what I'll do is I'll put my best team out later. It doesn't work like that. It's not, it's not football. No manager in their right mind thinks like that. It's not real. That's just pure fantasy. So it's like, I'm not, I'm not debunking again, obviously, what you're saying, Hayda. I just kind of laugh at it because it's not real. Nobody does that. Nobody says, I'll put my worst team out and then my best team and, and give it a go. He went out there to kind of keep Chelsea quiet that definitely worked. And in the last 15, 20 minutes, I would say for the most of the second half, United were on the front foot. And if those boys do their job, they beat Chelsea. You know, Chelsea were the team, you know, looking for that draw at the end of the game. Whereas I would say for the first 20 minutes, Chelsea were the better side. You know, Chelsea looked like the team with more intent. But you could probably say that if you've got Werner and Havertz in your team and you've got Pulisic, you probably should be the team looking for that goal early on. And if they score the early goal, 
that beca then becomes a different game, doesn't it? That means an Ole has to react. He never had to react yesterday. He was always in control of the result. What he was looking to do was win it late on. And, you know, that's when he kind of sent his, his team on to go and try and win the game. That's tactically fine as far as I'm concerned. I've seen, I saw Fergie do that many times. I've seen Guardiola do that. I've seen Klopp do that. Everyone does that. I don't think any of those managers say, let me put my worst team out first and then I might go and try and win it with my best team in the last 10 minutes. It doesn't really work like that. I've never really... It, it, that's not a tactic. That is definitely some kind of weird football manager jargon from a computer game. That's not not real life. No, I do agree with you. I, maybe I phrased it incorrectly. Not so much putting your second team out, but like I'm like I said, when you look ability wise, like you did say, like I said, Paul Pogba was fit. Then he probably would have played. Green was the same. What I'm happy about is that actually we don't need to rely so heavily on Pogba in these big games. There's options. Don't need to rely yeah, yeah. and that's the most yeah. important thing. Uh, what I will say is that, like I said from the beginning, and when I looked at selection, I wanted to see more creativity in midfield. But I do know that if you bring Pogba in, then you sacrifice that discipline. You'd sacrifice that uh, probably more of the shape. Uh, yeah. But then again, I feel like no, one of the questions here, actually, I'm going to read out one of the questions. We've got a couple of questions from, um, from Oli, at Oli Lish. I don't necessarily agree with this, but he says, when should we expect to see Oli's main game plan style more consistently? You know, he was asking, are we going, are we reacting from game to game? But I think this, that shows a good manager. I think we know our main system is obviously the 4-2-3-1, which we can go into a, a 3-5-2. This idea that Oli's style or game plan, like I think the fact that he can now change things is a positive, right? Oh, a huge, uh, a huge positive. And this is why bringing in five signings was preferable to bringing in one when we talk about Sancho. So, you know, I think in the weeks to come that you will see maybe Dan James slip to the bench or maybe even not in the first team squad and you'll see someone like Palestri come through. So, but it's a, it takes time and there is a process at play here. And I know fans hate that and they hate the word project when you talk about developing a squad because they, they, they again see it in kind of different eyes. They just want to see attacking football or they just want to be entertained. But when you're training behind the scenes and you're trying to find a way, it's, it's quite often a lot more workmanship behind it than that. Uh, I, I just think uh, you, you talk about how managers manage their teams. Definitely Guardiola, definitely Klopp have a philosophy. They play to a philosophy, so their systems reflect the philosophy. But most managers do not play to a philosophy. They play tactically to an opponent or, or their preferences from what they see on the training ground. And that's where I think Ole sits. And I think also Pochettino does. Pochettino doesn't Allegri have... Is the yeah. biggest one at that, Rob. Sorry? Negri is probably the, one of the best. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. players around the system rather than system around the players. Abs absolutely. So so even Mourinho, you know, d doesn't te always have a philosophy or something that you can kind of look at. We know how he likes to play, but he will play to whatever he feels his strengths are that week and looking at the opponent. And he's very focused on the opponent. He does tons of extra work on the opponent. Now, someone like Guardiola, you know Guardiola, you, that he's going to play that system pretty much every week, whoever he plays, whether he plays Barcelona or if they play Burnley. doesn't matter. He's going to play that system because he has a distinct philosophy. But I would say 90% of managers do not play to a philosophy. They play to what they have to beat in front of them. And I think with Ole, this is why he plays 4-2-3-1 most weeks because he feels that that gives him a solid base. But we saw against PSG, he played 3-5-2 because he had this new piece, which was Tellez. Tellers gave him really good width. It allowed Shaw to come inside. Shaw was much more comfortable, wasn't he, as a left centre-back than I say he was playing left-back yesterday against Chelsea. And you could see that maybe the pieces all fitted a bit more. What I will say is this. If you're going to play with a 4-2-3-1, that then is much more difficult to incorporate someone like Van der Beek. Why? Because Van der Beek is not actually a creative. Yeah? Van der Beek is in there to be a late arrival in the box as a number 10. His movement is what you, yeah. what you bring in. He can sit because he is busy. He can kind of do the Fred role. But when he's been at the football club for what, all of about four weeks, does is he really up to scratch with tactically everything that, say, Fred and McTominay do in that system? I think that's the fear. You know, you could put Ma uh, Van der Beek in there and he could probably do the job. But if he makes one mistake and Chelsea score, you lose 1-0. So I think that's why Ole has a preference at the moment with Fred and McTominay. Uh, technically, is uh, is Van der Beek a better footballer than both of those two? 100%, no doubt. But he's not 
a kind of incising ball passer. And that's one thing when you talk to Dutch journalists and talk to people from Ajax, they always say that to you. They always go, he's technically very good, but he's not actually a kind of incisive ball passer. And that is an issue. If you're, It's Paul Pogba. Paul Pogba is. So that's why I think yesterday you saw Pogba come in and play the 10, even though he doesn't really play the 10 as a kind of matter of circumstance most weeks, he will play more in central midfield. Uh, and that's why I think you saw Bruno go and play the matter role because Bruno can go and do what Juan Mata does. You know, if he's on the right hand side, he's not he's not there to do lung busting runs. He's there to kind of weave it all together. So, yeah, I, I, I just think it's systems. People are not going to find a philosophy of Ole. I don't think he's that kind of manager, but I do think that he's 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 got the tactical accreditation to do these things because he is a thinker. And that's what, again, you hear with people behind the scenes at Man United is that he's very good at analysing the data and coming up with game plans. And that's the thing, Robert. People that say you don't have tactics, you've just debunked that pretty much in three minutes. You know, he does have tactics. If he didn't have tactics, he wouldn't be able to flexibly change from a four at the back to a three at the back. If he didn't have tactics, he wouldn't have beaten PSG. It's nonsense, you know. My, my thing is, though, and this is my personal preference, like you talk about the philosophies. So you've got managers like Bielsa, you've got managers mm -hmm. like, like I said Pep, like Klopp, who have a system and they're able to essentially shoehorn those players into system and then they play part of the system so that if a player comes out, for example, we have a look at David Silva's gone now, Gundogan's playing a bit more, you've got Phil Foden. Yes, maybe the quality's dropped a little bit because David Silva was phenomenal, but still the roles are exactly the same. Gundogan's going to play exactly the way David Silva is going to pick up this pocket of space. He's going to look to to release, for example, the wingers, etc. He's going to play look to play balls into the box for those runners coming in from from out to in, like Sterling. And that's the thing for me is I think where I sometimes get a little bit concerned is that yeah, there isn't really like a you couldn't say what is Ollie's philosophy. I agree with you. He can change things up really well. He had he's a thinker. There are tactics there, hundred percent. There's a system there. But I want to see maybe I want to see United go to or play at home to Chelsea yesterday and be like, right, this is how we play. And that obviously comes with players, doesn't it? But do you think even when he gets the players he wants, that he would still be, I'm going to say tinkering in the positive sense, you know, changing it here for PSG, changing it a little bit here for Chelsea, you know, rather than going, right, this is how we're going to play. We're going to be, you know, for example, very high intensity press. We're going to push the fullbacks forward. The defensive midfielder is going to drop into between the centre backs. You're going to see Martial come deeper. Do you, you know what I'm trying to say? You know, there's specific mm. roles. Bruno will make those runs, and he will take more of a central role, almost as a false nine, etc. Are you? Do you think it's fair for United fans to be a little frustrated that they look over at Liverpool and, Ch and Man City, who've got the two best managers in the world, and they're playing exactly a style of football that you can pinpoint and say this is their philosophy? Mm. Uh, idealism is great in football. You know, every every football fan has an idea about what they want their, their club to play like. I think that Ole, since he's come to United, by and large, on the whole, has wanted to play attacking football. By and large. Yeah, not every game, but most games. That, you know, the idea is that you get the ball on the front foot and you go and score goals. Now, that was absolutely underlined by the signing of Bruno Fernandes. Yeah, in January, when United were really struggling to get on the front foot and score goals and were kind of losing games 1-0 because they weren't getting chances off, he went and bought one of the elite attacking midfielders in Europe. Now, did it work? You know, it worked. United came top four, so it worked. So the idea still is that your elite attacking midfielder is Bruno Fernandes. So very, very difficult when you talk about maybe how you use him and what, what you change. Do United fans have jealousy towards Liverpool and City at the moment because those two have managers who have incredible kind of philosophies about how they want to play? Well, let's look at it like this. Pep Guardiola is about a point ahead of Man United at the moment in the league. You know, I, I don't think anyone should be looking at the league as a, as a kind of base of anything at the I moment. Saw an today, Rob, uh, by Sam Lee in the Athletic. Sam Lee's brilliant, uh, you know, the Man City correspondent. And he, mm -hmm. he actually wrote an article saying, is Guardiola going to lose his job mid season? I was just about to say this. I was just about to say this. Guardiola's job is as that threat as, as anyone's at the moment because he hasn't signed a new contract and there will be a thinking at Manchester City that if he doesn't want to stay and be at the football club beyond next season, that Pochettino might be going to Manchester United if something happens. But they like Poch and they would like Poch if they didn't have Guardiola. But that then would see Manchester City change dramatically in terms of their stylistic properties. It would change overnight because you'd have a, a manager. But as I said Pochettino is much more closer to Solskjaer than he is Pep Guardiola. So fans have to sometimes realise that the grass isn't always greener. 
yeah, you know, I'd have loved Jurgen Klopp at Man United. I've said that so many times. I said when he when Liverpool got him, I said at the time, this is a complete disaster for United. Not because he's not because he's at, at Liverpool, but because he didn't come to United, and we, we're just about to see this guy do really well in the next two or three or four years. Now, I didn't think at that point he was going to win a league and a Champions League all within a five-year period, but it has taken him five years to re rejig that team and make that squad a championship-winning squad. But he's a special manager. Not everyone is a special manager. It might come to the point where Ole does run out of time and ideas and that we say, oh, do you know what? You know, Ole wasn't the right guy. But this is where you can reference Ferguson. You know, when Fergie came to the football club, he was this manager of... A little club called Aberdeen, who done brilliantly in Scotland of splitting the axis between Celtic and Rangers, and had had incredible success in Europe in the Cup Winners' Cup by beating Real Madrid and taking that trophy. When he arrived at Manchester United, he wasn't this kind of big, kind of huge name manager. He'd been he'd been coach of Scotland because Jock Steen had died and he'd taken that job temporarily. He was the assistant at that time in 1986, but he arrived at the football club essentially as a pragmatic manager who knew how to play players in roles. Yeah, He wasn't a, a hugely crazy attacking manager. He wasn't a Klopp. He wasn't a Pep. He didn't have that standing. It took him five years to fix Manchester United. A Manchester United team that I watched every week as a boy and used to think was seriously inept. We had one player, his name was Brian Robson, yeah, and he carried that club for years on his shoulders, on his own, scoring goals, making last-ditch tackles, the lot, the whole thing. But it took Fergie time and he got he got that chance. Now, I do not believe that Ollie's going to get that time. I said, obviously, after the Tottenham game, that he had six games. And I, I still believe that we're in that six-game cycle. He's won two of those games and drawn one yesterday. Um, what's that? That's a... Uh, so we got six goals. So he scored six goals, conceded one in those three games. One, yeah. So that is a level of success. That's a that's a building block. And he's going to get maybe another three or four or five games to prove that he's turned the corner a little bit. Otherwise, Pochettino is ready. But I just think you need to, everyone needs to calm down and let this manager go and do his job. He's never going to be deeply philosophical, but I do think he's got much more tactical acumen than anyone gives him credit. And everyone I've spoken to at Manchester United and beyond always says that. I remember Jurgen Klopp said it at the end of last season. He he kind of said something about Ole's tactics. And he said, do you think that Manchester United would give the job to a manager who hasn't got tactics? Do you honestly believe that any club would choose a coach that they thought didn't have tactical acumen when they're choosing a coach? Now, I think we can question loads of what the Glazers have done on the football side of the business. I don't think they'd have given the job to someone like that because there's there's plenty of other managers you can go out there and get if you if you thought that that manager couldn't do it. But Ole has to keep proving it, certainly to the fan base. But I don't think there's any issue within Manchester United. I think that there is a, a comfort between the players and the coaching staff. They're all fairly happy where things are. They do understand that they have to win games, they have to play better, and they have to kind of show that they're a championship contender eventually even if it's not this week but I don't think United fans need to be jumping off the edge of a of a cliff just yet <laughs> no well said absolutely well said always as always Rob Rob I've got one more question before we wrap up it's by Mad Mav and he's he's talking about sort of the de defensive resolve which looked much better yesterday and I will agree that I had concerns about Maguire and Lindelof but actually they both performed very very well he's asking the sort of question about you know that defensive resolve, do we have to sacrifice Flair up front? So he's talking about Dan James and Juan Mata playing yesterday. He's asking a question, and I know he's touching a little bit, but why were the likes of Pogba not starting? Um, and I saw a ridiculous uh, comment from Paul Ince there. I don't know if you saw it this morning, where he said Paul Pogba should leave or may not should sell him if he's not playing. Relax. I mean, it's, it's five games into the season. Um, but he's asking, you know, if United want to be going – more attacking and this is a question i kind of had as well or my thinking is that can they do it without fred mctominay as as that axis well, that's biggest? that that's the problem isn't it that's that's this is the kind of million dollar question you know patrice ever was saying yesterday obviously on for sky that that's not the man united he wants to see and i heard a, a lot of people saying to me on twitter i would rather you know in inverted commas manchester united played attacking football and lost it's like no you wouldn't don't lie you know, there's a balance. It's about trying to find a way. I hate when people say that, Rob. Yeah, I but look, look, I, I want oh, United to play attacking football. You know, I don't want to see United play uh, an extreme low block 
where they've got no attacking outlet and they might have one shot in a game. You know, 14 shots yesterday, 14 created attacking opportunities I'm fine with. I think that's acceptable. And to stop your opponent to one shot on target, I think that's acceptable. I'm happy with that balance. Um, would I like to see United to be a little bit more creative? Absolutely. But I think, like you're asking that question there about Fred and McTominay, and I think it's a salient one. I, I do think that Pogba can play with the with the right partner in a two in front of the defence. But then I would be worried about who my centre backs were. So that's the issue in terms of pace. Now Paul Pogba is not slow, but Paul Pogba is slow to react in certain situations, and he's not a natural defender. However, he's played as a defensive midfielder hundreds of times in his career like France. you know for France he won a World Cup playing that role but you know what it's a bit different playing that role when Kante sat next to you than it is Fred or McTominay I don't think Fred and McTominay are good enough defensively to play as the sole defensive midfielder next to maybe a progressive player so like you said there that you'd like Bruno playing there that would worry me because I would feel that there was a space there to exploit that would worry me if Pogba was playing there with Fred but can it work? Absolutely. If you get the training right, that's up to Ole to find a way. That That is the long-term way of looking at the Van der Beek question as well. You know, how do you bring Van der Beek into this team? Well, at the moment, you'd have to sacrifice Juan Mata. Does Juan Mata deserve to play? I think up until yesterday, yes. I think he proved it. Say, His man in a match against Newcastle in a 4-1. You know, that's why he came back into the team. He had the rest against uh, PSG. So Ole has to do this consistently and balance it all the time. Fans have this preconception about what they want the team to be all the time. I don't think Ole's moving away from a, an attacking style and all of his signings prove otherwise, don't they? You know, he just bought Cavani, an attacking player. You know, Van der Beek, an attacking player. These two young lads, Palestri and Diallo, attacking players. Uh, we, we're, not, we're not talking about buying destroyers or, you know, a ton of, Centre backs, are we? You know, we would have liked to centre back, you know, at one point, but he's buying attacking players, which tells you something. And I think we're going to see a lot of upside, especially from the two youngsters who are going to be on the right with Palestri and Diallo. Wait until you see this lad Diallo. We've doing, been doing more homework on him as this goes on, obviously, since we bought him. We knew a bit about him before, but now we know a lot more. I'm very excited about what we're about to see from him. Um, but overall, Ole does want to play an attacking style. He said it, he's shown it in his tactics. And I think the, that fans just need to calm about that. But I think the Pogba question playing as a number six or a new number six, I say the new number six, I mean in terms of style rather than what he what he is, he can play in front of a back four. But if you want Pogba to be the guy that tracks, you know, Havertz in there or Werner or Pulisic, is he the right player on the day? Probably not. Not when he's injured. You know, this is the other side of it. Someone said to me, why is Greenwood not starting? I went, because he's injured. And they went, well, why don't you, if he's injured, why is he on the bench? It's like, because since the start of time, an injured player who can give you 20 minutes, you put him on the bench, don't you? Because you might, you might need him. That's exactly what happened, wasn't it? You know, Mason came on with 10 minutes to go. Because if Mason gets that shot on his left foot, there's one boy I want with that on the end of his left foot. It's Mason, whether he's injured or not. I give he him that. That Rashford, what you know, that Rashford chance. I give him that ten minutes. You know, I take the chance. I think to myself, you know, I don't want him to get injured. He can't play forty-five minutes. He can't play ninety minutes, but he can give me ten or fifteen, and that might win me the game. That's that's tactics. That's actually that's actually sensible. Whereas football fans maybe don't see it like that. They just see it as binary in the team, out the team. Uh, I think the selection was fine yesterday. I think the, the selection was really good against PSG, and I think the selection was fine against Newcastle. Going forward, you know, Arsenal were a different kind of team now. They're, they're a team that are playing progressive football. And that's, again, looking forward. How are United going to set up? I think you'll probably play something very similar to what we saw yesterday, which, again, might mean that you don't play your kind of most attacking players. I, I can't, I don't expect Van der Beek to start against Arsenal. But I do think United will probably play that kind of 4 2 3 1 base and they'll look to counter on Arsenal. And they'll probably try to expose them depending on what they do with, with Partey because it's kind of like he is a, an all-action midfielder. Will he play? No one really knows at the moment. But it's, he's new to the Premier League. You would like to maybe expose that. Maybe see, does he know how these games pan out? Because he's been playing in La Liga, which is a completely different game. Yeah, fantastic points. I do think that on Paul Pogba, a lot of it, if he's going to play in that too, Hmm. In front of the you know in the defense, that double pivot. I do think a lot of it depends on if Axel plays behind him. I think that is 100%. the big thing. That's 
why we wanted Upa Makano. The thing is as well is that I think people forget when we do play 4-2-3-1 against the smaller sides where we have majority possession, you see how far forward everyone is. Even the centre-backs are sitting on that halfway line. Now, the biggest problem for me, and my, this is when people say, oh, he has no tactics. No, he wants him to go and attack. But you have to remember that if you get counted on, Maguire and Lindelof are not good, good enough or quick enough 1v1 against mm -hmm. Zaha, for example, like we saw against Palace. We saw that time and time again. So Oli's actually decided that he wants to be more defensively secure after we got ripped apart versus Palace. But now fans are complaining about that. Do you know what I mean? So you can't really win. But no, I mean, he, look, yeah, he, he can't. He can't win with that because because this is the whole thing about systems, isn't it? We talk about what what why are you setting up that way? You know, we saw Van Gaal at times play effectively with as a five four one, and United would spend ninety minutes passing the ball sideways and backwards. And I've sat there going, "What are we watching here?" Now that, that was a guy that I wanted to get the job, no doubt about it. Then Mourinho, as time went on, especially after the, the season of coming second, the second year definitely went to a more defensive style. And we were looking at the stats after games and going, my God, we had one shot the whole game and that was off target. And that was happening repetitively over like 5, 10, 15, 20 game runs. And that was worrying because it was actually coming from the manager telling his team to go and play like that. I don't think that's what we're seeing with Ole. You know, if he's setting up more defensively with a strength and a core, yeah, he's absolutely trying to protect, but he's looking at, nullifying what Chelsea can do while also allowing players to go and express themselves. Yesterday, Bruno and, and uh, Marcus had plenty of ball in the correct areas. And as we saw, Cavani came on and had two or three really good opportunities. United could have won the game. So I feel content with that. I look at the result and I say, well, nil-nil, not what I'm looking for. But uh, someone tweeted me today and said, you know, what if United draw the next two games, you know, insinuating that, you know, is, is Ole's job at risk? I think you have to kind of have a more expansive thought than that. And I don't like playing devil's advocate. I think it's, I think it's rubbish in football. I think you have to kind of have balance and I want to see the performance. I want to see the setup. I want to see how the boys are performing and how they're actually pushing themselves. And the last three games has been a good response to a catastrophic result against Tottenham because six, one at home was catastrophic. Again, it could have spiraled, couldn't it, Rob? I could. Like, do you know what? At that point, you know, and we talked about this. At that point, that was when all the journos who like to jump on, you know, dead bodies and graves were all going. That's it. Ole's out. This is the end. The players don't want him. The players. It's a uh, a, a kind of revolt in the dressing room. And we'd heard weeks of well, not weeks, months, months ago that obviously that this is not the case, and that the players. Enjoy playing for Ole. They enjoy his tactics. They're happy. There's a friendship between players there, which wasn't there previously, and that people are happy with the tactics. But, of course, had he lost the game against uh, Newcastle, which he nearly did, they obviously lost that first goal, and had they lost the game against PSG, and there were times there where Neymar was threatening and Mbappe were threatening, then we could have we could have talked about that. But you can see in these three games, that's not the case. They are all playing for their manager. Not one of them is there going, well, well I'll just have the afternoon off. You know, you know, this is easy. I'll, I'll wait until it's the end of the game and we'll just see what happens. And the manager will get set and Pochettino will come in and then I'll be happy. It doesn't really work like that. Players do down tools. It has happened. It's happened at Manchester United before. And it's happened at multiple football clubs. Are we seeing that at the moment? I would say 100% no. And I would say that there's been an improvement over a three-game period. The next three games are vital for Ole. Pochettino is still waiting in the wings. He still has to make sure these boys are ready. You know, Arsenal was a big game. And we'll see whether there is this kind of enthusiasm that I think does exist, but whether it's consistent. And I think with the new players coming in, that always gives you a squad a boost. You always feel a little bit more alive. You know, there's always a little bit more of a step, you know, to kind of move forward. These two centre-backs are still my biggest worry. I still think Maguire and Lindelof, they are the two senior centre-backs. But where do you, do you wait till you lose a game and then bring in two and Zabry? That's the issue, you see. Do you wait till one of them makes a mistake? and then? But can you drop two after they played so well against Chelsea? Tough decisions, aren't, aren't they? If you're the manager of that football club, that is a big decision, a big call to make when you've said to these two centre-backs, you're my senior centre-backs. But there is this kid there that we know is ready. And uh, he was on the bench for the right reasons yesterday. But going forward, can he get in a team in a back four? In a back three, absolutely. But in a back four, is he the guy you're going to pick? 
I hope so, but it's not necessarily that's the case that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will think that. Yeah, we well, let's look forward to the upcoming fixtures that got them in front of me. So we've got Leipzig on the Wednesday. Then we've got Arsenal at home on the first at Istanbul best next year. That's away. And then we've got another away game at Everton before the international break. Tough schedule. You know, we, we did say, as you said, six games. We've given Oli and he's done really well so far. But do you expect quickly, Rob, in the last five minutes? I mean, let's Leipzig quickly. Do you expect him to go to a back three? Because I think he probably will. I can imagine Axel will come in. I think Tellez will come in. I actually think Van der, Make, Van der Beek might start his first game. So that's my sort of little prediction. Because I think he could really thrive in that game. Maybe Bruno will get given a rest. I think maybe resting him for the Arsenal game is a sensible thing to do. Look, guys, we've got options. We can change things. On the Arsenal game... Now, that's very interesting. I agree with you. I think we might go back to a four. I think Pogba might start that game with, a, say, a Fred. You might even see Matic play. I mean, we haven't even mentioned Matic. And for me, Matic was so key to everything positive after the restart. I still think he's a wonderful player. He's still my pick for defensive midfielder. I think he's the best technically out of, Mc Scott, uh, out of McTominay and Fred. I think he's the best positionally as well. It's just his legs. I mean, we don't know how, he, how, how much he's got left in the tank, really. But... Arsenal are a team that will sit back. We've seen this in the big games. They don't really offer much going forward. So I think United should go and mm. will have more possession. I mean, that's what I've seen from them. I looked at them against City last week and I thought they've got a way of playing and it can work for them. You know, they hit people on the break. But I don't think Arsenal are as much of an attacking threat to worry about as Chelsea are. And I think we did well against Chelsea. I'd like to see United play a little bit more. I'd like to see Pogba come in and not play the Fred and McTominay uh, sort of axis in that game. But look, Tell me your views on those two games and what you expect us to do tactically. Yeah, I think Arsenal are much better back to front team now than they've been for several years. Absolutely. I think Arteta has got them playing from the back through midfield and to their strikers. And when you've got strikers like Lacazette, uh, Aubameyang, Ninketia, you've got players there. You know, William, I think, has been a big addition, you know, in terms of their style and how they can move through midfield. Um, they're dangerous. They're a dangerous team. They can hurt you. They can score goals against you. So I think that they're they're equally as dangerous in attack as Chelsea. That's that's how I view it. Uh, I do think that you might see two different kind of teams being played for the Champions League and for the Premier League. And the reason for that is we are still moving through this transition phase of of teams playing in Europe, playing a kind of weekend Wednesday, weekend Wednesday when the fitness levels are still being worked on. United have not had any pre-season. People must keep remembering this. And in fact, Guardiola was the guy who talked about it the most last week. And Guardiola was just like, people do not get how hard it is for me, my team to play well without all their fitness because I re rely on their fitness. They're not fit. So we're not, we're not, we're not there at the moment. It's the same goes for United. I think for those games, I think with those Champions League games, I think you will see him tinker a bit more. He will play three at the back. I think you'll see Two and Zabi play. I think you're absolutely right. I think that's where you might see Van der Beek get his opportunity and that Bruno goes to the bench. Or that might be the game where Bruno does sit more in midfield, uh, like he does for Portugal when he plays. And you might see Van der Beek given a, a bit more freedom to go and express himself as a number 10 or in that kind of role. Of course, you've got the Martial question, haven't you? Martial is, was suspended, obviously, for the Premier League games. That's the only reason why he's not played. So he will be back in the Champions League games. There's no doubt about that. So he'll play those matches. And that will, I think, determine a lot more uh, in terms of shape and personnel. The other issue is fitness with injuries. So I don't know if you saw yesterday, Paul Pogba got a really bad knock where he ended up on his backside. Back, yeah, yeah, so the injury that he had for France was his back and his hip. Yeah, that's why he didn't start for United in those games and also why he didn't start for France in the final game of their little run in the international break. Now, when he ended up on his back, you saw that it hurt him. Yeah, he was on the floor and he just kind of grimaced and you saw it wasn't a normal kind of, I'm just lying there. It was it was an ouch. Now, he got up and played and he does play through pain like like lots of players do. But that's, a, that's something you have to manage. You might look at that as Ole and think that's a risk there. He might not start any of the next five or six games still, you might still say, do you know what? I'm just going to bring you back in gently because I've got options now. He doesn't have to play Pogba. You know, Pogba doesn't have to start any of those matches that we've just talked about. He's still really valuable from the bench for 20 or 30 minutes as a kind of piece of the jigsaw. But I do think Ole will, will kind of play a few different systems and I do think we'll see through it at the back again. I think it worked really well against PSG. Leipzig are kind of similar team in terms of what their weapons are. 
Uh, I think he'll play with a kind of uh, the same kind of methodology through midfield against a Bundesliga team. I think that's kind of how he'd like to play. And I think we will see Van der Beek finally get his opportunity. And I think Van der Beek will do well. I don't think there's no one at Manchester United kind of making the noises that that anyone thinks that Donny's not going to do it or that he's out of the picture. There was a little shot of him yesterday where they had his shot on Sky and he was just like, and that's how it should be. Every yeah, player sat around. Do you every and- player on the bench should be sat there thinking, "I don't want to be sat here," and that's good. I think that's really good. I I want players to do that. If a player sat there on his phone, you know, eating chocolate, then that tells me something else. I'm like, no, I don't want to see that either. I'd rather see a player look miserable on the bench. Martial, when he gets substituted, always comes off, looks furious every time. I like that. I think that's how it should be. Every player should want to play ninety minutes. Every player should want to be picked. And I think Van der Beek will be a huge piece of the jigsaw for United going forward. Five games in, calmness. I always say it's like, I feel like a broken record. But I'm seeing things that I like as well. That's the other side of it. I'm seeing tactical things I like, and I'm seeing things from players that maybe I don't have faith in. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of Lindelof, but I have faith in what I saw yesterday. I thought, wow, that was good. You know, he carried the ball out. He shepherded Werner really well, a player who's much quicker than him. And those two looked like a partnership yesterday with him and Maguire, maybe for the first time this season. So you have to give people their dues. Um, you know, wan I think his confidence has improved. But again, attacking, that's a question for him. But defensively, he's looked much better than he did in those first few games. Would you agree? You know, I think those first few games, yeah. he, he looked soft, didn't he? He looked worried and he looked like a player out of form and out of confidence. He looks up to speed. Right? Absolutely. That's and Fred and McTominay, I think they both ended the season poorly. So when they got chances, especially McTominay, you know, they both looked miles off the pace. You know, they'd had knocks and one thing or another. They've come in this year, they've taken their chance. And I think that's good. So these are positives. One matter. I'd have sold him in the summer. I'd have let him go. I'd have gone go. And yet he's probably been a, one of our best players at the start of this season. And he was fantastic against Newcastle. And he shows that as an extra piece of the puzzle, He's probably worth keeping for a year or two. You talked about Matic. Matic, I'd have sold him last year. And then he had six months where he was brilliant. You know, I would still say that he was not the player that you'd want at the moment doing the kind of chasing role that both Fred and McTominay have done against PSG and Chelsea because he hasn't got the engine, he hasn't got the legs. But he's still a defensive piece that you might say, do you know what? If you're playing one there in the defensive role, he might be your guy. You know, you want him to kind of fill in. He plays that role really well. So role players, pieces of the jigsaw, United have got them this year and it's up to Ole to make it work. You know, it doesn't matter if fans like the the team selection, you can get on your bike, get on Twitter, moan as much as you like, you have no influence on these things. All you can say is uh, once the result is done, then you can kind of look back retrospectively and say, well, I was right about that or whatever. Even then it still doesn't matter, but at least you've got something to prove it with. I don't think anyone who moaned about the team sheet yesterday has got too much of a leg to stand on. Yeah, United didn't win 3-0. United don't win every game 3-0. Sorry, it doesn't happen. Fergie didn't win every game 3-0. Mourinho didn't win every game 3-0. You know, you can't always win matches. Sometimes you do have to be pragmatic in your outlook as United were yesterday. That's a great way to end it, Rob. What I will say is that for the first time in years, I mean, we're saying, why is this player playing? Why is that player not playing? But that's because there are a lot of players in the squad now that are playing to a better level. So now we, like we said, we have Oli has options. And to all the listeners, make sure you hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Rob, thank you very much for joining me again for the second episode of the Masterclass Tactical Podcast. Sounds good, doesn't it? Say in full. <laughs> yeah, it's good, mate. Thanks for having me on. No problem at all. And guys, make sure you check us out on audio versions as well, Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Type in Elite Football Show and you should find us there. And we'll see you next, well, probably this week, actually. No, next week. End of next week for our review of Arsenal. Thank you very much and we'll see you next time.